The cornerstone of any theistic argument is generally the idea that we have a soul, a non-physical substance or entity that is separate from the body and will live on after we die. Without this concept, most of theology and religion becomes pointless, for that would mean when we die, we are gone. No eternal reward or punishment for anything we've done. The idea of the soul explaining the mind or human consciousness in philosophy is known as substance dualism, as it posits a dual existence of the physical body and non-physical mind or soul. In ancient times, this was something that was difficult to challenge. With no understanding of the brain, it was often considered to be the best way to explain consciousness, even if the ideas of what the soul was or how it worked varied greatly. As understanding of the brain increased, however, this changed the playing field, and substance dualism would have to account for our brains being the source of our mental abilities. The most notable attempt was by René Descartes in 1641. He posited that sensory information was passed via our senses to the brain, which collected and organized it before setting it to the immaterial spirit. Recently, a Christian apologist who calls himself Telemantros attempted to revamp the idea of substance dualism nearly 400 years after Descartes first attempted to separate the brain from the mind. In his seven-part series, he attempts to demonstrate flaws in other theories of consciousness while also hoping to show substance dualism as the superior theory. This video will be addressing part six of his series, since it serves as his defense of substance dualism as well as a summary of the arguments he made in other parts. He begins his defense of dualism by attempting to rebut the argument from Occam's razor. Opponents of substance dualism argue that inclusion of a non-physical substance is unnecessary to explain human consciousness, and therefore Occam's razor can shave off this immaterial mind as it only complicates the explanation. Telemachus argues that physicalism cannot account for both intentionality and first-person subjective experiences, and therefore Occam's razor doesn't apply. Intentionality here is describing the idea that consciousness can intend to do something, rather than simply react to cause and effect, and the intention occurs prior to the action taking place. Therefore, consciousness can be about something besides itself, and since physical matter cannot be about something else, the mind must not be physical. Computer programmers would widely disagree. First, from an evolutionary standpoint, we can see how non-conscious processes can have a goal. Natural selection dictates that organisms better suited to their environment will, more often than not, pass their genes on to the next generation. There does not need to be a mind behind this process in order to result in very specific organisms suited to a very specific environment or task. We can see this in the evolutionary program developed by Carl Sims. Here a set of shapes have virtual offspring that are each mutated as dictated by a random algorithm. The ones that continue on to the next round are the ones that are able to get the closest to the green box at the end of the time frame, and in turn the survivor's offspring are mutated based off that same random algorithm. Not only do you get a variety of different types of virtual organisms, but also strategies to be the closest to the object. Some are straightforward and just bound right for it, while others simply swipe it away from their opponent. This was not programmed into their behaviors. The alternate strategy evolved on its own. But even removing evolution as an example, basic programming would also not conform to the dualist notion of intentionality. Take JavaScript, one of the most heavily used types of scripts on the internet. The script can assign a value to a variable, and within that code, the variable has a value of whatever is assigned to it, be it letters, numbers, objects, even true and false. All of these variables can be reduced to ones and zeros, to electrical impulses inside the computer. You don't even need consciousness to have something be about something else. Which leads into the idea of subjective perspectives. Telemontros claims that subjective experiences can only be explained outside of physicalism. This is due to the idea that experiences are not physical things, according to him. The classic example is that of a woman named Mary, who lives in a black and white room with a black and white TV, and books that contain all of the knowledge of the universe. Mary eventually reads these books and learns everything there is to know about the universe. Yet, when she steps out of the room, she experiences color for the first time, something she could not know by reading but only by experiencing. Therefore, experience cannot be a physical thing. However, it could be argued that subjective experience is merely a translation of information. Mary did understand color as wavelengths of light, but was given a different translation when her eyes came into contact with the wavelengths. Her brain translated the information her eyes received, and that is how she experienced it. Take a look at this math problem. Can you figure it out? If you said 221, then you are mistaken. The answer is 1101, because these numbers are actually in binary. You probably know this problem better as 7 plus 6 equals 13. Did you getting the initial question wrong mean you did not understand basic math? 
No, you always understood 7 plus 6. This was simply a different translation of the same thing. As for private first-person access to mental states, Telemontros is arguing that since the mind cannot be read, since thoughts cannot be discerned by looking at the brain, and mental states are only viewable or knowable by the individual, the mind cannot be the brain. For example, you could be thinking about ice cream, but I cannot tell by looking at your brain that you are thinking of ice cream. I have to ask you to find out. This is demonstrably false. In the landmark study by Haynes et al., they were able to not only tell whether people would decide to move their left or right hand, they were able to predict the person's decision five or more seconds before they actually were conscious of their decision. So not only can we know what a person is thinking or choosing by looking at the brain, we can know what they will choose or think before they themselves know. This is very damaging to the dualist position, as the best they can do to explain why certain areas of the brain light up during certain tasks is that the interaction between the physical brain and the immaterial mind is immediate, and the mind or soul is causing the brain cells that cause decisions to fire. If the brain is unconsciously affecting the conscious mind seconds in advance, this contradicts the dualist theory of mental phenomenon. It should also be noted that our current technology to scan the brain is still in its infancy, and yet still we are able to tell such things. With better technology and understanding, we might be able to tell you that you are indeed thinking about ice cream. In other primates, we can already tell when they are looking at the specific face or not. Telemontros also attempts to defend substance dualism against the argument that since damaging the brain damages the mind, the mind and the brain must be one and the same. His argument consists of stating that damage to the mind only appears to happen when the brain is damaged, but in reality only the mechanisms by which the mind manifests itself is damaged, and the mind itself remains untouched. The analogy he gives is that damaging a TV and speakers only destroys the TV's ability to manifest the picture and sound, but the picture and sound still exist within the DVD player. But the idea that our consciousness, our mind, exists as a separate immaterial substance is not what we see when we look at patients with brain damage. If only the ability to manifest our feelings was damaged, someone with brain damage could still feel the mind state of happiness, but be unable to express that they are feeling it. However, those patients who suffer personality change due to brain injury report that their mental states, not just their ability to express them, are changed. If Telemontros' theory was correct, and thoughts are caused by this immaterial substance, disrupting the brain would not necessarily disrupt our thoughts, only their expression. Observations of split-brain patients would seem to disconfirm this. Split-brain patients are ones that have had a small band of nerves in the middle of their brain known as the corpus callosum, severed to alleviate seizures. This nerve bundle serves as a bridge between the logical left side of the brain and the abstract-oriented right side of the brain, but without it we can actually see two separate people emerge. This is a video of neuroscientist Dr. Michael Gazzaniga, working with just such a person, or persons. Being told to look at the center of the page, a word or image is flashed on either side. If it's flashed on the side that handles writing, he's able to draw a picture of it, but can't say what the image was. This is conversely true if flashed on the opposite side of the screen. But isn't this merely showing a problem manifesting in action? Not necessarily. For example, if the word car flashes on the right side of the screen, the person is still able to say car. He is more than capable. But the part of the brain that handles language literally never saw the word car, so it doesn't know what to say. But if you ask him to draw it, it can do so, even though the logical side of the brain has no idea what it just drew. If there was some sort of non-physical substance that was interacting with the brain, it would have received experience of the word car regardless and would be able to tell both sides how to express it. But this is not what we see. If there was some sort of immaterial substance interacting with the brain, it would be able to serve as a mediator between the two sides, retrieving the information from the left and sending it to the right. I see no reason why an immaterial substance that's connected to the entire brain would not be able to serve as the corpus callosum if it were in fact severed. The more we study the brain, the more we see that substance dualism does not fit in with what we understand of our mental processes. Telemontros' argument is generally either ignorant or ignores the majority of neuroscience that would seek to debunk his claims. And even if this evidence was not here, the proposition of the soul is generally just ad hoc and there's actually no evidence that such a thing is even possible. Have a nice day. Honest Discussioner, out.